This morning I got an email from Ken Anderson. Who's Ken Anderson? Anybody? The chair of the computer science department. Uh, except it wasn't him. <laughs> so the latest scam seems to be for, for faculty is that people go look up who the chair is, make a Gmail account with that name, because you can put your name as anything, right? You can say, you know, your account is BB123, but then you can put Ken Anderson as your name. And that's all that shows when I get email. It just says from Ken Anderson. And this has been happening a lot. And it typically just says, are you on campus? Which sounds like it might be the chair asking me if I'm on campus. But this one had a little bit of extra bad uh, English in it. So I immediately knew, oh, you know, this is not Ken. And you look, sure enough, it's not. And I always just delete these because, you know, you shouldn't reply, obviously. But this morning I went, hello, Ken type person. <laughs> What for do you need assistance type functions from me? I said. <laughs> <laughs> and he replied. Okay, good. I'm in a meeting right now, but I need to get you need you to get a task done for me right away. Please, can you help me get to the nearest store close to you now? <laughs> That's not good part. Unless he's been drinking, it's not talk like that. So unfortunately, um, then all I got after that is hello, are you there? And I replied a bunch more times, but the OIT is killing all the emails apparently, so I can't show you. But I was saying I wanted to assistify this person in <laughs> any way possible. But I can't now receive any more e emails, which is super sad, so there goes my morning. I was <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's going to want me to buy gift cards. That's the kind of the normal thing. And then send them, scratch off the pin and send them like the number in the pin so they can take the money. Often in, in Nigeria, we call them Yahoo boys, these guys in Nigeria who like, number one sector of the economy in Nigeria is oil. Um, number two is fraud. <laughs> At least that was true a couple years ago. It may have changed. They, they've been cracking down more. OK. Anything you want to talk about? Before we go back to our last scene hero, the shell code. All right. Yeah. So one question on last one. Uh, thinking about it, um, why not give the path to the shell code? Because let's say you want to run lead. You know, yeah. how will it know where lead is if it doesn't have the path variable in there? Okay. So the path variable is a shell variable that the shell looks through to find out whenever you type X Y Z. It wants to know what X, Y, Z are you talking about. And if the path is empty, there is no default path. It just doesn't know what you're talking about. So it consults this path variable, and it looks left to right down the settings for these various absolute prefixes or relative, relative paths to, and appends X, Y, Z to see if it can find an executable that it can run. But um, when we're doing exec, we're not, we don't have a shell. There's no shell in the picture at all. In fact, what we're trying to do is run the shell in this example. We're calling the kernel, and we're saying, run this executable. So we can't send to the kernel, oh, by the way, here's a path variable for you to consult. That's not something the kernel does. It doesn't even know what a path variable is. That's something the shell looks at. And you could write a new shell tomorrow that doesn't look at a variable called path. It looks at, like, dir list. Or you can make up your own shell variable. Or you can have a fixed path in your shell that doesn't even look at an environment variable and only looks in these certain places. You can do whatever you want. But the shell is just a program. It's not special in any way other than it's a well-known program that people study and learn and expect to work in a certain way so you can use the machine. But you could write your own shell tomorrow. In 2400, do you write a shell? Some versions did. No. Okay. Shells are no, no big deal. They don't have any special privileges. They're not set UID or set GID to anything. They're just a program that anybody could you know, run any other program in place of. And paths only matter in that context. OK. Uh, anything else? All right. So what we were trying to do last time we were here was we were trying to set up a world like this. Our world needs to have. Four registers, EAX, BX, CX, and DX, set up like this. This is the service code for what? 
sec e e, right? That's the thing we want to do is we want to, and we're going to spot a shell that consumes whoever calls exec e e, whoever does int eight zero. We're not going to fork. So we're going to go straight up exec with a code of uh, b, that's what we're going to get as an exec. Exec what? BNSH. Uh, and that's about as short a path as you can say to any shell. Bin dash is two letters longer. And you have to do that sometimes, perhaps. But bin sh works on Razor. The C ECX has to point to RV. So we're going to need two pointers. We're going to need a pointer to bin sh and a null pointer. And then a pointer to that is an ECX. So this will be data somehow. So will this. And then we need EDX to point to zero. Because we we're not going to provide an environment. And as we said last time, we can conserve some memory by doing it this way. So if we can get bin sh, those seven letters, with an null terminator, eight letters, into memory somewhere, then we can point a pointer at where that memory location is, <coughs> put it into the EDX. <coughs> but we can also allocate other memory that has a pointer to that string and then four zero bytes afterward. We can point to that memory at the ECX, and then we can just cheat with the EDX and point directly at the second slot to get our environment. So we can uh, double dip here and here, just to save some bytes. Okay? So how might that look? Oh, this is just a synopsis of everything I just said. So I won't say it again. But yeah, we're going to set up these four registers, put a, a V here. Um, Set up C, set up D, and then we have to do an int 80, and that should work. And we're not going to clean up afterward. We're not going to call exact. So in assembly language, it would look like this. Move the string address into wherever we're storing the string's address of the address. Terminate bin shell, which we're going to put down here at the bottom. Okay, so we'll have all of our assembly language, which will be machine language bytes, here. We'll put bin shell at the bottom. We're going to stick a null byte at the end of this, so null terminated. Then put a four byte null string at the bottom past this. Put a B into EAX, the string address, which is here, which is the address of bin shell, into the EBX. Load effective address means the address of the thing, not the actual thing, into the ECX and the LEL, load effective address of the null string, into EDX, we do our int 80. And then this part here is the cleanup, but I'm not going to actually do it in the shell code. So move a 1 into the EX. Anybody remember what code 1 is? Exit. It's the exit call. And then 0 would be the return code for the exit, which is 0, which means everything is fine, which is a lie and then exit cleanly. So these last three instructions, actually, we won't put in the shell code. I don't know why I have them on the slide. All right. So we're going to have a problem. One problem is, first thing I did is I said, take the address of this string and put it into memory so that I can point at it, because I need the address of bin shell plus right after I need the null pointer so that I can have an argv. I need to build argv. But I need the address of this. And this shell code could be anywhere in memory. So I need to know where it is in memory. That's going to be a pain in the butt. Because this shell code is going to be injected into somebody's buffer. That buffer can live all over the place. And having to know that when you're injecting it is going to be really hard. So there's a trick that we can use to get around this problem. <coughs> To make our shellcode relocatable means it will run anywhere. Um, the jumps and the calls, by the way, are not a problem. So if we're going to do jumps and calls from our shellcode, those can be done in a relocatable way. How come? Because it's relative to itself. Relative jumps and relative calls. So jumps come in two flavors. I can say jump to this specific address in the text segment. Jump to address 1, 2, 3, 4. Now your code is not re relocatable because it has to. The, 
place you're jumping to has to always be at one, two, three, four. And that's fine. If the compiler sets it that way, it's fine. But you can make it a relocatable jump and say jump 74 bytes forward, jump 32 bytes backwards. Those are also supported by the x86 processor. And those are relocatable because you move your code anywhere and it still works. 74 forward and 32 backwards are always going to be the same no matter where the code is in memory. So we'll use a jump and a call that'll be relative. And what we're going to do is jump to the end of the code and then call back to the beginning of the code. The reason we're doing this, the jump will just change the EIP further down. But the call, when it calls back to the front of the code again, has a side effect. What happens when you do a call? Change the EIP and? EBP. Or it, it pushes the net instruction, the address of the next instruction onto the stack. There's a push. This is part of the call instruction. Because that's supposed to be paired up with a return instruction, which pops the EIP back off the stack. We're never going to pop. We're never going to return. We're just going to do a call, and we're only doing the call to get the side effect of pushing something on the stack. And the thing that's going to be pushed is the address of the next spot, and the address of the next spot is going to be bin sh. That's how we're going to then get it. We're going to pop the address of bin sh into a register. Let me show you. So this is just a nifty trick. Here's buffer you're overflowing in the victim. As you know, as you overflow the buffer, <coughs> there's going to be a saved frame pointer here that we're going to clobber. We have to. And then the return address, and then these are the parameters down lower that we don't care about. So, SSSS, this is all shellcode. The J's are the jump instructions. And the jump instruction is going to jump not uh, anywhere other than just to the call. So, we're going to overwrite the return address with the address of the start of our shellcode. And that will begin the takeover of the machine by our code. Now, our code, as we said, needs to put the address of bin sh into the ebx, and the rev into the ecx, and the np into the edx. And it doesn't know where it is. And the string is going to be down here at the end of our injected code. S bin sh will be down here. How do we get the address of it? So the first thing we'll do is we're going to jump, relative jump, forward to the end of our shellcode and then call back to right after the jump. Okay? So we do this exercise only because this call is going to push something on the stack that we want. And then when we, we resume running our call, we're going to pop into the EBX. And the EBX will now have the address of what? whatever was right after the call. The call changes the EIP and then pushes the address of whatever was right after it onto the stack. Because that's the place to resume execution. These are not instructions. This is slash bin slash sh. The address of slash bin slash sh will now be on the stack. You get it? Do you really get it? Somebody was like, yes, and then I said, you really get it? And you're like, no. <laughs> okay. So, um, let me grab. What? Oops. It'll come back. Okay. There it is. Um, so Here's your shell code. Yeah. Even this man's dying now. Okay, so let's just say we're running our code. Somehow we got this part to work, jump to shell code. So we're executing our shell code. And your shell code is going to be a bunch of instructions. Jump. Pop. Move. Da, 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 da. And down here is call. And then literally, in machine language, call is going to be like, I don't know, CD10, blah, 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 right? And then right after that should be some more instructions.
because when you call, you expect someday there's going to be a ret, and the ret's going to come back and resume execution after your call. That's not what's going on here. We don't have any more instructions after this call. Minus 47, I'm going to say. Literally right here is bin slash sh. So we do not want to return, because when we return, we'll start executing slash bin as machine language, and that's not machine language, it's a string. Okay. So your, your code takes over. It starts running. There's going to be a jump plus 42. These are the wrong offsets. We, we can go see what they actually are. That'll cause the EIP to go down here and start executing down here. This call immediately jumps back to this pop instruction. Okay. Obviously, don't jump. Don't go back to the jump instruction. You're in an infinite loop where you're pushing onto the stack over and over and over, and you blow up. So we're going to call back to just after this place. A side effect of the call is that this address, 1234, gets pushed onto the stack. So here's the ESP, 1234, is now sitting at the top of the stack. Because calls always do both a push of the next address and a transfer of the EIPs controlled somewhere else. Both two things at once. next thing that's going to happen is we're going to do a pop EDX. Ah, that pulls this address into the EDX. What's that address? It's the address of slash bin slash sh, which is exactly what we want in EDX, because that's supposed to be the thing we're going to exec. So, if instead of all this, if, if assembly language had, the, or machine language in the x86, if we had load effective address of myself plus 48 bytes into the EDX, we could do it in one instruction. There is no such instruction to do that. There's no way to say, there's, no, there's nothing that says like, give me where I am plus 48 bytes and put that in the EDX. You know, like move EIP plus 47 comma EDX. That would be a great instruction. We could avoid this dance. It doesn't work, it doesn't happen. So instead, jump forward, call back, and pop. And that gets us this address into the EBX, which is what we want. We want the address of the thing we want to execute in the EBX. Okay? So that's the, that trick. That'll be part of our shellcode. So it's going to look like this. Relative jump to M call. And then call to A jump, which is this label back to here and then pop into the EBX. And now, we don't have an EAX set up or ECX or EBX, but EBX is completely done. It's pointing to the address of quote BIN slash SH. And I'm putting a little X here because that's where the null terminator is going to go. And then I'm putting AAA and BBB. AAA is going to be the address of bin shell and BBB is going to be 0000. That's my RV I'm setting up. And the reason I'm reserving space for it, you'll see in a minute. You don't actually have to do that in your shellcode, but in order to demo the shellcode, I need to reserve space. All right? Do you understand the jump down and the callback? Do you understand the pop? Get the address of BIN slash SH. We're not done. We've got to null terminate this, too. Otherwise, it's a bunch of garbage. Okay. Uh, move a zero into the EAX. How many zero bytes are being moved? Four. Four, because EAX is a 32-bit register. If it, said, if it said AH or AL or AX, those would be 8-bit eight eight and 16-bit. This is a 32-bit move. So all four bytes of the EAX are zero after this instruction. Move, e, move AL into seven past wherever the EBX points. What's AL? Lower. Address of the accumulator, the low eight bits. The lowest eight bits of the accumulator, of the EAX, what are they currently set to? Zero, zero. Zero. Move a zero byte where? Seven past whatever the EBX points to. What does the EBX point to? Slash B I N slash S H. So what's putting a zero doing? A null terminating. Null terminating slash bin slash S H. Okay? So this little X now is getting over it with a zero byte. 
I couldn't put the zero byte there, it wouldn't work, so I'm gonna write it there. And when you're copying, when you're stir copying, buffer overflowing, this code, you can't have a zero. You've gotta place the zero. If you have a zero, it'll stop. It'll stop string copying, because zeros terminate a string copy, right? String copies terminate on a zero byte. So you can't have any zeros. So you couldn't have a zero here already or you'd stop overflowing. You need to overflow not only this, but all the way down to the return address that you have to clobber in order to exploit. Okay, so we put a zero by here. Move the EBX into eight past where the EBX points to. What does that do? What's in EBX right now? Not bin SH, but the address of whatever this is. STR address, whatever that value is, is in EBX. Move that value into eight past where that value points. So what's it doing? Well, the address right now isn't written down anywhere. It's just in the EBX register. But I need to write it down because I need an argv. I need an array of pointers. So my argv is going to be this AAABDD thing. So what am I going to overwrite AAA with? Whatever this address is, which is sitting in the EBX. So take the EBX and write it on top of AAAA. That's going to become my argv array. Eight past whatever's in the EBX is going to become my argv array. It's got to go in the ECX. But I have to set up the values of this array as well, in memory somewhere. So I'm going to put that address on top of AAAA. Then I'm going to put the EAX, what's in the EAX right now? Four zeros. I'm going to put that at 12 past the EBX. That's the BBBB. So I wrote the address of this string on top of AAAA. Then I put four zeros on top of the BBBB. Remember, I can't initialize those, those Bs to zero because string copy will stop. Well, why do we need to use EAX there? Why not just put zeros directly into that location of default in EBX? You could, you could say dollar sign zero, but the next slide will point out why we want to avoid that. Okay. And you've already got it in EAX, so you might as well just move that register into this location. But dollar sign zero would work as well, but then it would present a problem later. Move dollar sign B into the EAX. How many bytes is, is being moved? RB being moved? Four bytes. Four bytes. We could have just moved the low byte, right? Because EAX is all zeros already, but we're moving four bytes of zeros and three bytes of zeros and a zero B at the end into the EAX. Why are we putting a B there? Exactly. We're getting ready for exec BD. All right. So EBX is all done. It's got bin SH with a null terminator. EAX is all done. It's got a B in it. That's what we want. To get the ECX set up, we need to point to this array. This is our RV. Aha, load effective address of eight past whatever's in the EBX. That's our RV. Put that in ECX. And then load the effective address of these last four zeros and put that into the EDX. That's just a zero pointer. That's our MP. And now int 80 spawns a shell. So this, if we have this in machine language with bytes and we jump to it, it's going to spawn a shell. Assuming that like slash bin sh exists on the machine, which almost always it does. So how do you put that string uh, below the code? The bin sh string. This is all just going to turn into bytes. This will be bytes, and this will be bytes, and slash is 2f. And B is 6-2. These are just bytes. And these bytes will continue past this until we get to the return address on the stack. And we're going to overwrite that with the address of the first instruction. And when the victim attempts to return, it's going to jump here, and it's going to do all this jump and call and dance, 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 and we're going to get a shell. And that shell will have escalated privileges, elevated privileges, because it's going to be exploiting a victim that's set to right here. All right, so let's create a program in C to try this. 
Has anybody ever seen, seen inline assembly language in a C program? Did you know you could do that? You can stick assembly language in the middle of your C program with under, under, ASM, under, under directly. That will tell the compiler, don't compile this, it's not C. Just stick it in line. You know the compiler compiles to assembly language first. Then it assembles, then it links, and then it produces an output. And you can say minus capital S and tell it stop at the assembly language stage, and you could look at the assembly language that the, that the compiler produced. This just means don't compile this, stick it in line with everything else that you compiled into assembly, and then run the assembler on everything including my stuff. You won't get a compiler error on anything that's misspelled here, you'll get an assembler error. It happens after the compiler runs. All right, so is this going to work? Imagine my compiler just looks at this and goes, there's nothing for me to do here. There's no, there's no C. It's just, uh, it's just a bunch of assembler. So then it runs the assembler, assembles this. Let's say, for the purposes of argument, it works. The assembler doesn't find any mistakes, no errors. And then I get an executable. And I run it. And as you know, in C, there's a there's a init routine that sets up the environment, and then it calls main, pushes your parameters, arg C, arg V, and P, and then it calls main. First thing main's going to do is run this. Is this going to work? Is that dot string in front of the bin sh? That's like an assembler. That's an assembler directive. It just says, stick these literal bytes. When you assemble this, make these bytes machine language corresponding to these assembly language instructions. And this, just put literally 2F6269, the actual bytes in the assembly language. So you don't want to run this. This is just data. Does that look right? I mean, I don't expect you to have it memorized and go, yeah, there's a mistake right there. But does that roughly look about the same? We got our string. Um, how about if I compile it like this? So M32, that means I want a 32-bit executable. That better be. I'm reading, I'm writing 32-bit assembly language. Um, stack boundaries to, that actually doesn't even matter. Exec stack, that doesn't matter either because we're not running anything on the stack. We're running this in the what segment? It's going to be in text segment. It's actually part of the code. I'm not putting this in a variable and then running the variable. Compile it. All right, let's do that. Awesome. Um, disassemble it. There's a knit. I don't much care about that. That's the, that's the stuff that runs before main. And what I care about is main. Okay. So here's our, here's our shell code. GBP, move ESP, what's this? Preamble. Where's our, um, so push EVP is save the frame pointer for my caller, adjust the frame pointer to me, steal the frame pointer for my own purposes by copying the stack pointer into it. Then the, there's a third step of the preamble. What is it? It's three steps for the preamble. Local variables. Local variables. 
which is a subtract from the stack pointer the proper amount of space for my locals where that's not there because there are no local variables in my main. I just went right into the code. Yeah? So that one's missing. Jump 80483FC. What's that? That's my first instruction of my shell code. And it's a relative jump. Why? EB1C, that means a relative jump 1C bytes forward. That's, uh, what, 28? 16 plus 12? Let's say jump 28 bytes down, which is going to be to my call. Okay? And it's even helpfully like, telling me that's the M call label, just in case you forgot. So jump to here. E8 is a relative call. How many bytes? What's this? Why is it all a bunch of FFs? It's a high at this. It's negative. It's a negative jump. It's a twos complement offset. Remember 2400, right? Twos complement has a sign extension. So uh, I don't know. I can't do it in my head what F, what DF is. You'd have to flip all the bits and add one to get what the positive version of this is, right? Remember twos complement? Please just lie and say yes. Um, so this is going to jump back, and it's telling you jump back to A jump. Which is right here, A jump. Okay? So call back to here. As a side effect, over in Stackville, we're going to push what address? 8401. This is going to get pushed on the stack. These instructions are not instructions. 2F is a slash, and that says B I N slash S H. Okay? That's bin S H right here. So this address, 8401, is going to get pushed. We're going back up to here, pop into the EBX. What are we popping? This 8048401 is going to go into the EBX. We can single step this if you want and watch it work. Pop EBX, put a zero into the EAX. This is just the same old dance we just went through. Put a zero there only so that we have a handy zero, so that we can use the zero to null terminate. Put the address into our first argv slot. Put a zero from dx into the second argv slot. Set up a b into eax, argv into ecx, mp into edx, int eight zero, and that should spawn a shell. Okay? This won't work. It won't work because anybody, it's obscure maybe. You already know everything I'm about to say, but. Thinking about it in this context may be hard. And this will crash right here on this instruction. Move AL, comma, seven, parent EBX will crash. You cannot write it to the data segment. It's not the data segment. You can write to the data segment. You can't write to the text. You cannot write to text. Yeah. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah. This is all in text. Unfortunately, so is our bin sh and all this other stuff. This is data. We need to modify this. Self-modifying code is not allowed anymore. This is not the 1970s sad, sad things. It's now no longer allowed that you, uh, you can't write into the text segment. And this is going to be loaded in text. We could move this to the data segment. And change our code. But that would be dumb because when we exploit, we need this to all be in one place. We get one buffer to overflow. We don't get to say, okay, victim, please put this over there, put that over there, now jump to here. It's going to all be just one self relocatable package that we inject. So I don't want to do that. We could do it, but I don't want to do it. So anyway, this won't work. If I try and run it, seg faults. If I, uh, See if I can get this to work. Core file. You ever seen a core file? You know what core dump means? What's core? Core is a type of memory from the 1960s that actually had physical iron cores. And that word has persisted to 2019 still. It just means memory. Um, 
This sec vaulted. Why? Because we tried to write to the text segment. You can't do that. It's marked executable and readable, and that's it. No writable. Core dumped means that a picture, a snapshot of memory was taken at the point where the illegal thing happened, and it was put into a file called core. Have you ever done this? Yeah? GDB inline core. It segmented right here. See the arrow? That's where we predicted it was going to segfault, because that's the point where it's trying to write to the text. OK? That doesn't mean our shellcode's no good. Our shellcode is actually quite fine. It just can't run as a text segment piece of code, because it self-modifies. But it can run on the stack. So let's run it a different way, OK? Any questions? All right, so instead, let's grab the bytes. How do you grab the bytes? I've got some hints or suggestions here on how you can grab the bytes. We actually just had them, didn't we? Because we had right here. I'm searching for main so I can find these. Let's copy these bytes, starting with 5.5. Five. No. Why not? Yeah. I don't care about the preamble. Those are not part of my shellcode. I want my shellcode. EB1C. That's where I want to start. So I'm going to copy these bytes. These are the machine language bytes that I want to inject into a victim to get a shell. Uh, cut and paste or whatever. EB1C. 5B, all of this stuff, down to there, and stop? No, I need to call back, and then stop? No, I need slash bin slash sh, and then I can stop, right? Well, I'm going to go ahead and take some extra bytes to allocate for space. And I can put this all into the data segment. Aha. So if I write my C program, ignore all this clutter. If I write a C program where this is a global variable, because it's outside of main, the global variable will go into the data segment now, not in text. So this is now code, but it also has some data, slash bin sh, blah, blah, blah. And that's data. That's going to get modified. But this is going to be run, not modified. It's in the data segment. Now, you can't execute the data segment. It's not marked as executable. Except I'm going to compile it minus z exec stack, which gives you both executable stack and data sync. So then I can run this. Then the question is, how do you execute a variable? We did this once before with Metasploit. And in the Metasploit case, what I did is I casted this sc to a pointer to a function, and then I called the function. This time I'm going to do it a different way. And I don't know why, just to do it a different way. So instead of casting this to a function and then jumping to it, invoking it, I'm going to do something else. What am I doing here? So I'm not copying my shellcode, right? I'm leaving my shellcode where it sits. But the address of the shellcode, right? So int sc, this is taking, sc by itself is the address of this array, which is in the data segment. The type of that sc pointer is pointer to character. I'm, I'm casting it to int. So it's no longer a pointer to a character. It's an integer. Star ret is also an integer. Where is it? It's the address on the stack of this local, this is complicated, plus two. All right, 
So, I don't know if it's worth understanding, but let's understand it anyway. So, main, this is probably good to go over just for more exercise of your brain when it comes to how the stack sits. When main wakes up, what does its world look like? What's down here? First thing it gets. Chart address. Even lower. NP, RV. RV. RC. Return address. That's to wherever it's supposed to go to after main exits. Then? Save. Save, save frame pointer. That was, that's been zeros every time we've looked at it. I don't think the caller has a frame pointer that it references, but whatever. Okay. Then, it's local variables. Does it have any? Yeah, yeah it's got one that's called ret, bless you. This one's called ret, and its type is pointer to integer, right? It doesn't have any initial value because we don't initialize stack variables. Are whatever garbage is there remains there. All right. So that's the setup, preamble. Now the instructions begin to run. First thing I need to do is get the address of ret. That's going to be whatever this is, one, two, three, four, for example. Get that address and do what with it? How do you fight? Cast it to an integer pointer. What is the type of, of ret? Pointer. Integer. It's a pointer to an integer. What is the type of the ampersand ret? Pointer. Pointer. pointer to pointer to integer. Right? So I'm going to cast it instead to a pointer to an integer. And then I'm going to add two. What's that going to do? This address plus two will become one, two. Because its type is pointer to integer, if you take a pointer and you add in C, you have a pointer to integer, and integers are four bytes, you add two, it adds eight to the pointer. Every time you increment a pointer, it's going to matter what the pointer points to. It's a character pointer and you increment it, it goes up by one. It's an integer pointer and you increment it, it goes up by four. It goes up by the slot size of the thing it points to. This is pointing to integer, so this is plus two is going to make it go down by eight. Up in value, down picture by eight. Okay, so ret as a variable will contain one, two, I, I don't know, is this hex? Should be hex or should be decimal? What do you want? Hex. Hex. One, two, three, C. So now it has an address of the return address. Aha! We just extracted with this really bad code. Really bad code. This depends on like how much alignment padding there is on the stack, and the compiler could move things around. It might not work, but it's saying. Take this value and set it to two slots down the stack from where I live and store that in ret. So 1, 2, 3, C goes into ret. Okay? That hasn't caused any damage yet. All we did is we're looking in a place we should never be looking. And now we're about to change it. That's when we are really being dastardly. And we're going to say take the, this value cast it to int, because that's what star ret should be, and write it into whatever ret points to. Uh, so this is now going to be the address of our shell code. And this brace means return. And when you return, it's going to deallocate its locals and then jump to this address, which is our shell code. This is a lot more. This is a lot trickier than just casting this to function type and jumping to it. And casting this to a function and then dereferencing the function is portable and clean and fine. This is ugly and gross and dependent on the compiler. But it will work. 
as long as we compile this minus z exec stack. If you forget the exec stack, it won't work because you can't execute the stack. You can't execute the data segment. Any questions? Yeah. I was also curious, so on the previous slide you had that assembly code, which was making, it was like that underscore, underscore, assem, or whatever it was. Yeah. Could you just store it? Because that was just a string, right? That whole thing is just, or is it? This assembly directive means to the compiler, don't attempt to compile this as C, skip it from the open close phrase. But so, oh, I see, okay. Never mind then, yeah. Is there no error without the new line and tab at the end of the Yeah, yeah, you get, uh, it's this funky syntax where you have to add these new lines and strings and quote every line. But I was just wondering if it's the last one that would have that. Yeah, I think it's okay as the last line. Okay. I'm not a guru on inline assembler. I don't know much about it, but I got this to work. And this is handy for you to have because if you want to rewrite the shellcode later, it's really hard to do it in, the, in GDB. So you could take this, change bin sh to maybe local user local bin leet or some other string down here. It's going to mess up your offsets. Actually, no, it won't mess up your offsets because it's it's past it's outside of the offsets. But you know, it might require you to understand something else and change something else. Maybe not. And then you can use objdump or gdb to extract the new bytes and get everything to work. It will. If you make this longer, what's going to happen? Your set, your null byte goes elsewhere. These offsets are going to change. So you know, you need to understand all of this if you're going to change this. And it's probably a good idea to change it at least for one of the levels. And some people I've seen use Metasploit instead. Whatever you want to do. But don't skip the part of the class where you need to understand this. You should try to understand this code. Okay. So, the next problem. We've got zeros in our shellcode. And we know that string copy and those vulnerable functions will blow up when they hit a null byte. Okay? So we can't have any zeros. And we've got zeros in our shellcode. Where? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We cleverly don't, we did put one in the middle of our, at the end of bin sh. We've got to put a little x there. Otherwise, that would be another problem. That one's OK. But we've got seven machine language bytes that are zeros, and we can't have any. Because if we run this, we inject this into a victim that is sensitive to zeros, it's going to copy all the way up to this first zero and stop. And this is the only machine language we'll actually get into the victim. We want all of this into the victim. So we've got to get rid of our zeros. And Right here. <laughs> these four and these three. So how are we going to get rid of? Once we get rid of those, we're good. Easy. Instead of moving four, this is the, this is these are the four zero bytes we're putting in EAX. Do this. Does that work? What does XOR EAX EAX do? Zeros out the EAX. And look at the machine language. No zeros anymore. And God, we just saved three bytes. That's cool. How about this? Instead of moving, what is this doing right here? Moving B. Moving to the entire register. Putting a B into the EAX, it's little endian. Yes? So it's going to be 0B first, and then the high order bytes come after. But EAX, if you recall, was already four zeros from this guy. So if we want it to be zero B, we can just move the least significant byte, B into the least significant byte, and leave the other three zeros as they, as they were from up here. We don't need this. And so we save three more bytes. OK? And B, zero, zero, B, no more zero bytes. We're done. Cool. You know what I never did is I never ran. Let's go run the code.
here it is. Um, this is with the zero bytes. Do you see the zero bytes here? That's okay, because I'm not string copying. I'm just jumping to it right now to try it out. And notice that I had to say plus three here. That's because I went into GDB and found out plus two didn't work. I need to go plus three further down the stack. So, and when I compile, I better have minus the exact stack or else this won't work. And do I need M32 here? Absolutely, I'm, I'm injecting 32-bit machine language into my victim. You better know if you're injecting machine language whether this victim is running as a 64-bit executable or 32-bit executable. A 64-bit machine can run 32-bit, but it has to be in 32-bit mode. If it's running a 64-bit victim, you're, not, you're in 64-bit mode, and you can't shove 32-bit machine language at it. It won't work. Okay. There it is. It worked. Only because of minus the exact stack. I'm pretty sure that if I said, oh, I don't remember the flag. Minus C. What's going to happen? Right? If I turn off the executable stack on my data set demo, it doesn't work anymore because now I'm trying to execute something that's in the global variable SC, which is in the data segment. It doesn't work. So you need that on. All right. But we've got zero bytes. So here it is without the zero bytes. The zero bytes used to be here, but 31C0 is XOR EAX EAX. So it's gone. Now we used to have a load of 0B000000 into the EAX. It's gone. It's B00B. Now we did also have to change some other things when we eliminated three bytes up here and we eliminated three bytes down here, what does that affect? The relative jump and call. The relative jump and call. We don't have to jump as far down because our, our code just contracted by six bytes. And then when we call back, right here, this is the relative call back. That also got shorter. It's a, it's a, a larger negative number, a smaller absolute value. So by losing two by three bytes here and three bytes there, this decreases to one six, and then this changes to an E5 to call back less. But we just saved bytes. We're now down to 46 bytes of shellcode. That's not too bad. And it should still work. Let's try it. We're going to compile this in the same way. Same exact flags. Data seg version two is just the same thing without the null bytes. All right, so you have shellcode. I'm giving you this, right? This is in the slides. It works. You can inject this into a victim. Happy days. Any questions? All I'm doing is demoing my shellcode, right? I'm sorry if this was answered before, but what, if you type in who am I into that, that that, uh, that bash session the sponge yeah the spawn shell um, is it gonna print you or yeah okay all I did was I wrote a program to spawn a shell okay. and I could have just done this and got the same result okay. right I'm still me but all I'm trying to do right now is do some research to develop 46 machine language bytes that I can then inject into someone else's code so that I become them. Right now, I'm just playing with me becoming me in order to figure out what 46 bytes are going to work here. But then I'm going to go run it on the homework, and I'm going to have an effective GID one higher when that shell spawns, and then I'm going to type leet. If you were going to run this on like a 64-bit machine, 
now that we've taken out those like explicit zero copies, is there anything that would make this longer on a? It seems like we've removed a lot of the stuff where it's like you're an explicit yeah, so write out. When the x86 processor, this x86 under 64 processor runs, it runs in either a 32-bit emulation mode or it runs in a 64-bit native mode. And that's determined at the, at the beginning of the program. So if you're going to take a victim and that victim is in 32-bit emulation mode, you can stick 32-bit machine language into its environment and run it. It'll stay in that mode and keep going. But if it's in 64-bit native mode, can't just shove 32-bit. It won't just go magically like, wow, this looks like 32-bit machine language. I better switch over. It won't do that. It'll just crash. Yeah, I guess, I guess my question is, like, we want to get the shuffle as small as possible. Yeah. And when we had to, like, explicitly put in those zeros, right. that would sort of, like, expand, that would have expanded even more for 64. Yeah, because there would have been much more zeros to make it a fully 64-bit immediate. But now that we've gotten rid of all that, is yeah. it, would it still be, not, like, whether it would run or on a 64 -bit. Oh, I see, I see. It's like, it would it still be as concise? Size be, uh, um, yeah, I mean, we have one offset that's 32-bit uh, offset for the negative value for the callback. That's going to be a bit longer in a 64-bit machine. 64-bit um, might be a little bit more verbose. Some of these instructions might be a little longer, a couple more bytes. But it won't be like double the size. It'll just be a little bit longer, probably. But we could go and we could go do this. We could go compile uh, the inline code without M32 and see. It might not work because uh, the assembly language is written for 32 bits, but it might work. You know, try it. I'll give it 30 seconds to see if we can learn something, and then we'll move it on. So you can't even go down to down to the value two on M on preferred stack boundary on a 64-bit compile. Operand type mismatch from pop, so it's upset that I'm running 32-bit uh -huh. okay. code. You'd have to modify it to work. It's it's saying you can't pop a 32-bit register off the stack. You have to pop. So I'd have to change this to RBX. A bunch of these would have to go to R's. But you know, probably in an hour, I could get this. We could get this working on a 64-bit machine. We yeah. could do this whole class in 64 bits. It's just ungainly to have big ass things in your face all the time, and the homework is much easier to do, and no less informative and, and educational to do it on a 32-bit machine. I mean, 2400 is now done on a 64-bit machine. You just deal. And you get eight more registers on a 64-bit processor, right? You get R8 through R15. OK. In 64-bit, so when you're making a call to exec VE in, or exec in 64-bit, that would be looking at RAX, RBX, and RCX, right? That's right. OK. Anything else? And actually, EAX is then part of, is it like part of RAX, right? It's, it's right, a, the low 32 bits, right. and then AX is the low 16, and then AH and AL are the lowest and second lowest of the 8-bit values. Okay. All that's preserved in the 64-bit machine, too. And there's some exceptions, but let's not go into all that. There's some exceptions on which byte registers you can get to on a 64-bit machine. And then I think it's like R8D is the low 32 bits of the R8 register, so it's not even uniform. The naming structure is not even uniform anymore. It's a mess. But it's our mess. We're computer scientists. And you're never going to have to deal with this stuff, honestly. Unless you become a malware expert or embedded systems engineer or something like that, you're not going to see. Having the power to go into assembly language and see what's going on is really, really useful if you're going to be a ninja level software person. You really can understand all the way from the highest level of SQL and Ruby all the way down to the bits in machine language. You should. That's what makes you amazing instead of just another web programmer. Sorry to all the web programmers. All right. So, uh, all right. so we've got Shoko with no zeros. It relocates.
locates. You can run this anywhere. It doesn't have any absolute addresses. It doesn't have to run address 1, 2, 3, 4. It can run anywhere in memory, as long as it's executable memory. All we need to do is inject those 46 bytes into a victim that has privilege. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. If it has no privilege, what are you even bothering trying to compromise it for? And then we can spawn a, spawn a shell and escalate our privileges, because we're running with privileges in that shell, provided the shell does not drop privileges, which our shell does not. Now, the victim has to be attached to your terminal, or else the spawn shell will give you a dollar sign that you never see. Okay? So if this is something running in the background, or running over a socket on a remote server, you're not gonna spawn a shell, and you're, you know, if, you, if you ship this over the internet to somebody, and it works, there's gonna be a shell prompt out there you don't get to see because it's not coming back up in the socket. Instead, you need a reverse shell. Remember those? Then you have to put some networking code into your shell code. But for Razor, you're on the machine, so you can just spawn a shell and you get to see the prompt. Except for leveling. All right. Um, you have to be able to inject without an EOF, so you often can't do pipes because pipes, when they terminate, send an EOF. And as I've said like 87 times, you may sometimes want to run a different command other than min shell, like running leet instead, in particular for one level, that'll be useful. In fact, almost mandatory. So you'll have to massage your shell code to run leet. You could just add like eight more bytes to it, to the slash bit. It's, it's very straightforward, but it does change some of the code. And some people don't fully understand how the code works. And so they don't understand how to modify this. This is bin sh right here. They don't understand how to make this say leet instead. And I've seen tricks like this. People will put, they'll copy the shell into slash temp, because slash temp slash sh is the same number of letters as bin sh. And so then it just, they can just overwrite this without understanding the code, or whatever. Just, you know, you'll have to do something to run it. Um, I'm sorry, they copy leet into slash temp and rename leet to like LT. And then they can run slash TMP slash LT in the same seven characters as slash bin slash SH. <laughs> because you don't want to have to learn how to add 10 more characters and change your offsets, okay. Or they use Metasploit and just generate different shell code that runs leet. That works too. Sorry, I'm going through that again. Um, 10.35, I was gonna exploit a victim. Um, we'll get started with it, but I think we won't finish it until Thursday, a week from today. Unless Nick Dunn wants to do it, but probably he won't. All right, so we need to inject our 46 bytes where? We could put it in the environment, because we control the environment on Razor, because we have a shell ourselves. This doesn't work over web connection, or web forms, things like that, but for Razor it works. We could put it in the environment, we could put it on the command line. Let me ask you this. If you have a victim, and you run it, with this victim program, and you looked at the source code, it doesn't even look at RC and RV at all. Is that okay? Just a little. Yeah, you don't have to look at your command line parameters. You don't care. But you put your shell code right here. And by, I don't mean you typed in shell code. You can somehow get the actual machine language bytes onto the, onto the command line. The victim runs. And it doesn't consult RV1. Is, is this code still within the address space of the running process? Yeah. Yeah. It is, right? Because the setup code is going to copy this into RV and provide it to the, to the victim, even if the victim doesn't care and doesn't look at it. It's still there. So just putting it on the command line sticks it into the environment. And then all you have to do, of course, is get it to copy it in over a buffer and jump to it, which is, of course, the hard part. 
All right, so you can get it into the address space either in the environment, because the environment's going to be in high memory on the stack of the victim. You can put it on the command line, even if the victim doesn't consult the command line. It'll still be in the address space. Um, we're going to have overflowing buffers, so that's going to be copied from somewhere onto a buffer that doesn't check its bounds. Also, we're going to assume that the buffer won't be modified before the function returns. Obviously, if you copy your shellcode into the stack, and then the code keeps running and then starts messing with that buffer, it's going to corrupt your shellcode. That's a really good exercise. I should, I should do another level of Razor. Where it corrupts, it corrupts the buffer, so you have to put like shellcode that's going to be not work, but it's going to then modify it to work before it returns. That would be pretty cool. Like maybe it just flips all the bits in the buffer and then returns. So you have to put like XORed shellcode into the buffer first <laughs> so that it'll DXOR it and run it for you. All right. Um, bonus level. Huh? Bonus level. Yeah, bonus level. level, yeah. <laughs> no, I do. I have a, um, a bonus level that I'm. I, should. I have one that, um, that works even in the face of canaries. So it's a challenge that I turn canaries on. I haven't described canaries other than in passing, but canaries are hard, makes it harder. But there's a way to do it, there's a, like a trick exploit to works that works even in the face of canaries, but it's hard. But I could make that a bonus level or a separate challenge. Maybe I'll do that this, this semester. All right. Um, all of this is easy to do if you have source, easier to do if you have source code, it's not easy to do. This is hard. It's, all of this is hard. And of course, um, Doing things that are remote over a connection, or doing things where you don't have shell code, I'm sorry, source code, it's harder. This is our victim. This is about the simplest example of a badly written buffer overflow victim program you can imagine. Explain. Local variable, that's my buffer. It's generous in size, 256, will accommodate any shell code of your choice probably. And then copy off the command line into the buffer with our arch enemy number one string copy. Right? And that thing is just going to blindly copy from rv1 into file name until it sees a zero terminator. All right. So we're going to inject this. We're going to provide an rv1 that is too big. It's going to be more than 256 bytes. It's going to cause it to overflow on the stack, hit the return address. Then this brace here will cause return to execute. It'll jump to the shell code on the stack, give us a shell. Life is beautiful. All right, so one problem is going to be that we need to know, there's still an address we need to know, unfortunately. If we didn't need to know that, this would be an easy class. So here's our buffer. It's called file name. What time is it, please? It's at 41. This is 256 bytes, yes? What's right after it? Save. Frame pointer. What's after that? Return address. Return address to main, right? Or to, in this case, init. What's after that? RC, RV, NP. RV is going to be a pointer to an array of pointers. And this pointer is going to be to your shell code somewhere on the stack. And this code is going to say, go to RV bracket 1, sorry, RV, it's going to be the victim itself first, right? Because that's RV 0. 
And then RV1 is going to be pointing to your shellcode and saying, yes, GR, copy all of these bytes until you get a null into these bytes. So your shellcode is going to be copied. And we're going to copy not only 256 bytes, but 260 bytes, which will clobber this with four more. And then 264 bytes, and then we'll stop, because we don't want to like start blowing out everything else down here. And that's all we need. We need to overwrite this. Okay? Then when main returns, it's going to jump to here and execute this. And this is relocatable. It doesn't have any fixed addresses, and it'll just work. What's the problem? We do need the fixed address of the I need to know this address. So I need the address of the file name buffer. And I need to know that number so that I can, when I inject my shellcode, overwrite this. With that, right? So I want to go shellcode, 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 46 bytes. Garbage, 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 I don't care because this is never going to run garbage over this, and then I need exactly the right address here to be this address, so that when return occurs, it jumps to my shellcode. And now half of the class is thinking about no offsleds, because you've seen this sort of thing before. Okay. Also, if this is moving around, our world's going to hurt and suck and be bad, because we're going to not only have to hit this address, but this is going to be a dancing target. Every time we execute the victim, it's going to be somewhere else, randomized. So we have turned off randomization. We're going to end here because it's 1045, but let me just show you real quick. Um, So this flag is zero. That means stack randomization is turned off. If I say echo one to, if I turn it on, which requires uh, root, does that surprise you? If I turn it on, and then I grep, uh, ah, can't type. My stack is at what address? This is 64 bits. Is that the same or different? Different. My stack is moving all over hell, right? It's going up and down, these different addresses. This is going to make things really hard to hit when we have to hit this moving target. If I turn off, it always stays in the same place, yes? So on Razor, that's turned off. So you, you can reliably assume your stack's always going to be in the same place. So all we have to do is put all we have to do <laughs> is figure out where this buffer lives. It's going to live in the same place every time you run the victim. It won't move. But it's like quantum physics. Every time you look at it, it seems to be perturbed by the fact you looked. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be maddening in GDB. Things will be constantly moving. If you change the size, of your RV, it's going to cause more stuff down here, which is going to push these addresses lower, which is going to cause this to be different. See what I'm saying? So if you put a small RV just to test, see what I'm saying? Try to get this address, and you go, okay, now I'm going to put a buffer overflow RV. That's going to move this. You're going to need a different address. So get ready to be frustrated, kind of. But anyway, on Thursday, we'll actually exploit this simple victim. Yeah. So with ASLR turned off, the program's always going to start in that same place in memory? Text, data, stack will always be assigned to the same uh, addresses every time, which is the way the world used to work before buffer overflows. This ASLR is a countermeasure in response to buffer overflow attacks. So what if there's like another process that's, let's say somebody else runs their shell code and it just happens to be the same hard-coded addresses, then it's... Google virtual memory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
you, I can run it, address one, two, three, and you can run, and they're actually mapped to different places in actual memory through the virtual mapping system, virtual address system. There's no, so there's no way to just call. I don't know. Right. 